for six months about our guest being here tonight. I first met Ron McClare at the Compton Traditional Rendezvous several years ago. The first year we hit it off, and the next year we became friends, and the next year we became very good friends. And we found out that's because we have so many similar interests. We've been together all weekend. We did a radio show this morning, and, and uh, you're just going to love hearing Ron McClare's stories. Before he comes up here, I want to tell you, this guy is the real deal. He has roots all the way back there in those old stories that we all like to talk about the good old days. He makes a fine bow with the Super Shrew Bow Company. And uh, before I talk anymore, I'm going to bring him on up to Mr. McClare. As Jim said, uh, we met several years ago and, and hit it off. And, and uh, we, we like a lot of the same things. Uh, uh, we're both good singers, <laughs> except I don't play the guitar. But uh, when Jim told me about your organization, down here and asked me to come down. I, I was real flattered. I said, well, is that the best you can do? Why don't you get somebody like Dee Fred? Or, he said, no, Ron, I want you because I want you to tell me the old hunting story. So I'll tell you a few of those and how I got started in traditional archery. But uh, first off, I want to thank all of you for uh, the warm welcome, how you've treated Nancy and I and made us feel just like family. And uh, one of the young lads there, what's his name, Mason? Is you right there? He came up to me and he said, Mr. LeClaire, he said, do you do any napping? And I said, I sure do, but I missed my nap this afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow in me, and, and it just lit a fire. And I had to have a bow and arrow. I was only five years old, so my dad made me a wooden bow and some arrows. And I run around the yard playing Robin Hood. There was a boy down the street or down the road a little while later that he got a real bow and arrow set. And uh, he was probably 10, 12 years old or maybe older, I don't know. But I followed that guy around like a little puppy dog, watching him shoot that bow and arrow around the fields. And it was just something that it stuck with me all my life. I, I felt just like this little kid that just discovered archery, and I still do. And that's what I love about it. When I was... Uh, 11 years old, I had to think there for a minute. I won my first archery award at summer camp. My folks didn't have a lot of money, but they, they sent me to a real nice summer camp one year. And uh, they had a lot of, uh, a lot of activities. You, you signed up for, they had horseback riding, riflery, canoeing, swimming, uh, woodcraft, archery. And so I signed up for all that stuff and then signed up for archery. Well, I remember that we used to shoot at a big 48-inch target, multicolored target, probably from, I think, 20 yards. And uh, I shot this bow, and every time I'd go to this class, I'd shoot this same bow. And it was really a dark-colored bow, kind of a round, English-style bow. And as I think back now, it was probably Osage. And it was lightweight, because I was 11 years old. But I just loved shooting that bow. And got to the point where when the one hour class was over, I wouldn't leave. I stayed till the next class came, and I'd shoot with them. And the next class came, and I'd shoot with them. And the next class came all day long. All I wanted to do was shoot the bow and arrow. Found out later from my dad told the story, he said the camp director called me at home long distance, and that was a big deal back then, long distance phone calls. He said, your son doesn't want to do anything but shoot the bow and arrow. And my dad says, well then let him shoot the bow and arrow. <laughs> so that's what I did the whole time I was there. I did, I did go to the swimming class once in a while because I liked that. But uh, that's how uh, infatuated I was with it and that's how strong it was in, my, in me. When I was 16, uh, I remember I bought a uh, Parex aluminum bowl out of a second-hand store. And uh, by that time we moved off the farm and uh, into town and I didn't really have a place to shoot but there was a railroad track there. I used to walk down the railroad track and shoot arrows into the telephone poles. So uh, it was just archery was a big part of my life, all my life. And then when I got to, uh, to uh, I think it was 1955, I started bow hunting. It was the first year I bought a license and started bow hunting. And I'll never forget my first day in the woods with a bow. It was a 1955 Air Kodiak, 52 pounds. Uh, wood arrows, I don't remember what kind of broadheads I had, but I just went out the woods and sat down on a log. And uh, pretty soon here come a deer. 
and I saw this deer that was coming my way, and I started getting excited. Then I started shaking, and the deer got closer. I started shaking really bad. When the deer got close enough for me to shoot, I was shaking so hard that that arrow went somewhere, but I had no idea where. <laughs> it's probably still up there in the woods somewhere. But uh, then uh, I met a fellow that had work uh, that uh, was older than I, and I didn't know at the time how involved in archery he had been, but uh, he heard that I was a bow hunter. So he kind of took me under his wing, and, and we went out to a local range and did some shooting together. And then he invited me to come down to, a, to an archery tournament at uh, uh, Detroit Archers in Michigan. And uh, so I went with him, and we were walking down alongside this building, and I, and I can see it like it was just yesterday. This man was walking toward us, it was Fred Bear. I had seen pictures of Fred before, but had never, never seen him in person. So as he came toward us, I nudged Carl and said, Carl, Carl, there's Fred Bear. Carl just smiled and said, yeah. And as we got closer, and Fred's eyes looked over and met Carl's, he says, Carl, how are you? And he walks over and stuck his hand out and shook hands, come to find out they were good friends, and they were both charter members in the Michigan Bowl Hunters. And Carl introduced me to Fred Bear. And uh, I want to tell you, after that, Carl grew about six inches for me because I thought, I am a friend of a friend of Fred's big Fred Bear. So that was my first time meeting Fred. I saw him many times after that uh, down the road because he was always at all the events, and most of the events in Michigan. And uh, got ahead of myself a little bit. I, I about uh, the year before that, from about 1957, I was a single guy and I was dating, you know, looking. Uh, looking for my uh, soulmate, and uh, found out that most girls weren't interested in talking about hunting. Bows and arrows didn't impress them. So, uh, but one day I met this girl, cute little red-headed girl, and started talking to her about hunting. And she just warmed right up, you know, and we started talking back and forth. Then she told me that she was real familiar with archery because her cousin, her first cousin, Jack White, was the national champion, 1953 national champion field archer. So uh, anyway, long story short, our first date I took her to see Old Yeller. <laughs> I, I just come out. The second date I took her ice fishing. Most girls would have went, went on to go off the lake, you know, about 10 minutes after they got out on there, but we stayed out there and ice fished all afternoon. Then uh, shortly after that, I bought her a bowl, a little 39-pound uh, semi reaper they call it back then. Got her some arrows and she uh, she lived in a uh, apartment above a doctor's office in town, in Lansing, in town. There was no place to shoot, but they had a garage at the end of the driveway. So I put her up some hay bales and she used to stand out on the sidewalk and shoot up the driveway into the garage at the hay bales. So anyway, I figured, well, this is the gal for me. So we got married. February 28, 1959, and that was 49 years ago, just this last month. <coughs> and we went on our first bow hunt together that year in Upper Michigan. We didn't have a lot. Uh, we borrowed uh, her uncle's 9 by 9 umbrella tent. We borrowed sleeping bags. We borrowed uh, Coleman cook stove. Uh, we borrowed most everything we had except our bows and arrows and clothes on our back. He went up there and camped out in the woods and, and hunted for, for a week. Uh, we didn't know much about bow hunting still. I still didn't then. And, and we saw a lot of deer, but we usually saw the tail end of them as the flags were going through the woods. But Nancy has been my bow hunting partner. She hasn't missed a, a fall hunting, have you, honey? You, you, she's hunted with me every year since 1959, so she's my number one bow hunting partner. Then uh, I'll tell you a little story about Nancy's first deer. We were hunting on state land in northern Michigan, and back then there was no tree stands. They weren't legal. Uh, nobody baited. You didn't know what bait. Bait was for fishing. Uh, so we uh, we would just go out and we would find runways. The deer were moving from the bedding areas from the cedar swamps up into the hardwoods, and we'd build brush blinds along the trails. So 
I built her a blind pretty close to the trail, probably 10, 12 yards. And I told her, I said, now honey, I said, the, the deer are going to come out of that cedar swamp down there and they're going to going to come up this trail and they're going to walk right by you here. And I had her sitting on a stool, a folding stool, and so that she was down below the blind, like this. And uh, I said, now let the deer go past. And then when, when you, after they go past, I said, stand up and shoot over top of the blind. So she's sitting there, she told me this story later. Here comes some deer out of the swamp. They come up the trail, they walk past her. She stood up and a stool squeaked. <laughs> and away they went. So she waited a little while, pretty soon here comes some more deer. I think that happened twice, didn't it? Here comes some more deer, same thing. She let them go by, she stood up, squeaked, and away they went. So finally, here come a couple more deer, and it was a little yearling doe in the back. And she said, well, if I stand up, they're gonna, the stool is going to squeak. So she tried to pick a hole in the blind. She shot right through the blind. And I don't know if she hit the blind, deflected her or what, but she hit that deer right in the middle of the ham. It, it uh, tell you a little bit about her bow. Uh, was a 25 pound to 24 inch bear polar, ladies polar. And I had a bear razor head on there with a, you know, a cedar shaft without the insert. And uh, the deer ran out there about 80 yards, turned, it, turned around and looked at her and just dropped right there. So that was her first, her first deer. Um, my first deer, which I got before she did. Um, <laughs> I was hunting in the same area, the state land, and, and I started bow hunting in 1955, and I didn't kill my first deer until it took me seven years, because you know there was no books, there was no videos, there was no tree stands, there was no baits, there was no seminars. You learned the hard way. By, uh, so I was sitting out there in the woods and uh, found this nice little tree close to the cedar swamp. So I sit down on my hind end and I noticed that, gosh, here's a deer trail right here. I didn't know it was that close, but uh, well, I'm here. I'll just stay here because I'm comfortable. Pretty soon here, here come a deer out of the... And she comes up over the hill. She's about... 12 or 15 yards out there and she stops and she sees me and I've got this 66 inch Reeker Bear Kodiak Special 60 pounds so I kind of drew the bow horizontally I don't know if I got full draw or what but I, I got it back and I let it go the deer whirled at the shot but the arrow caught it in here ended up it was a liver shot but we uh, we trailed it uh, a long ways back into the cedar swamp and uh, found the deer and uh, my, my partner was Carl, the guy that got me <clears throat> started and introduced me to Fred Bear. And when we found the deer I got a war hoop out of me and Carl said, well we might as well go home. He says, you scared all the deer out of the county. There won't be no more around. But uh, anyway, the hunting back then was, there, there wasn't a lot of bow hunters and <clears throat> but there were a lot of deer, at least in, in the areas that we hunted. Then uh, when, I, when I got into uh, organized archery, uh, I joined an archery club and started shooting tournaments, uh, field archery tournaments, which was a lot of fun. And I, I'm a little competitive where I used to be, and uh, so I practiced hard and, and got really good at it. And so all through the 60s, <clears throat> I shot competition archery. And I started out shooting bare bow, and then the real competition was in freestyle with sights. So I, I went that way, and I got the sights on the bow. Went to Cobo Hall, shot in the International Indoor Open. Uh, shot on the Michigan team, along with uh, some real great shooters of the day. Uh, Dickie Roberts was the national champion in 1966. And, uh, in 1966, I went to the state championships in Michigan. Uh, we shot three rounds, a field round, the first 28 targets, a hunter round, the second 28 target, and an animal round the next day. Anyway, after the first 28 targets, I was leading the field. I was the number one. After the second round, Dickie Roberts had come up and tied me, so we were, we were tied for first and second place. So uh, we went home that night, and I didn't sleep very well that night. 
And the next morning I'm standing on the number one target with Dickie. <clears throat> and he tried to psych me out. He looked at me and he said, Ron, he says, you know, when I won the Nationals last year, he said I shot a perfect ammo round. I said, yeah, I know Dickie. And he said, and I'm going to do it again today. And I said, well, I said, you're going to have to if you want to meet me. <laughs> so naturally, uh, he did. He shot a perfect round. Unbelievable guy. The, the guy just, the harder the competition, the harder he shot. He was just that kind of guy. He was just unbeatable when the, when the chips were down. But anyway, I, I, didn't, uh, I didn't fret much about being beaten out by a couple points by a national champion. So, uh, let's see where I got my gun. My first bear hunt was uh, <coughs> Upper, Peninsula, Upper Peninsula, Michigan in 1964. And I went with another fellow up there. At the time, I had just gotten a brand new Kodiak, uh, bear Kodiak bow, with 70 pounds. And I had. Uh, some forge wood arrows. I know a lot of you know what forge woods are. And uh, Zwicky brought in, and I thought, boy, when I see this bear, it's going to go through him like a hot knife through butter. And my buddy was uh, was a big guy. He's bigger than me, but he shot a little 45 pound <laughs> bow, and he shot with, with uh, pins. So I kept razzing Bob all the way up there, but you know, I said that bow here is going to bounce right off that bear, and I said mine's going to go through him like a hot knife through butter. And he just grinned, you know, so we got up there and I remember when I got my chance at my bear, I got a good broadside shot at about 18 yards and that arrow hit right on the shoulder. The bear took off and after about two bounds, the arrow dropped out. Left the broadhead in there, but the shaft just fell out. Then we looked and looked, of course we didn't find the bear. Well, then the next, the next day, uh, Bob got his chance and his little 45 pound bow took it behind the ribs, angled up into the lungs and the bear went about 40 yards and that was it. That was a long trip home. <laughs> <laughs> he never let up on me. In uh, about 1970 or thereabouts, uh, something happened to the archery world. The, the compound came along. And uh, everybody just, the archery world went crazy. One minute archery was fun and, and uh, everything like it had been for years. And the next thing you know, that everybody is shooting these machines. And he just, to me, who had, a guy that had been started and in, influenced by stories of Robin Hood and, and Fred Bear and, and people like that, those things just, they had no romance no romance, they had no history, they had no meaning to me. So uh, I dropped out of archery, organized archery, that is. I didn't quit shooting or quit hunting for quite a number of years. And uh, finally it was in uh, 77 or 78, uh, some of you may have been in this long enough to remember uh, the magazine that came out of Tucson, Arizona, the Longbow Shooters Digest, anybody remember that magazine? Anyway, there was a guy named Harvey Overshiner that published a, a magazine called The Longbow Shooter's Digest. It was all about longbows. Well, I had read the book of uh, Howard Hill in 1964 and always had a fascination for longbows. Plus, that was, you know, that was a Robin Hood type bow too, so. I, um, I called Howard Hill Archer. The only place around at the time where you could get a longbow. And they said, uh, we got a six months wait. Six months, oh gosh, I can't wait six months. What do you got in stock that's left-handed? And Betty Eakin, Craig's mother, said, uh, we've got an 85 pound big five. I said, whoa, 85 pounds, I, don't, I can't shoot that out. Let me think about it, I'll call you back. <clears throat> so I went and got my, uh, I had a 50 pound recurve, and Nancy had a, a 35 pound red wing hunter. And I strung them both up, and I grabbed a hold of both of them, and I grabbed both strings. It's 85 pounds, right? And I and I got it back to my face, and I thought, whoa, I can pull 85 pounds. 
So I called Benny back and I said, I'll take it in a dozen arrows. Well, when, when the bow came, took it out of the box and, and uh, just a beautiful thing, you know. And I don't remember how I got it strung, <laughs> but I did, I got, it, I got it strung. And I went out in the backyard to my target and I shot four arrows and I couldn't get the fifth one back. So I shot four arrows and I go down and get them, come back, and by that time the blood had run back down into my arms and I could shoot four more. So I got that bow about mid-September and uh, our, our bow season started on the 1st of October. And on the 7th of October I killed my first deer, uh, a nice little seven point buck uh, with my 85 pound hardy longbow. And that's when the, when the longbow started for me. And I got, I was having so much fun with it. I thought, boy, there's a lot of people really missing out here. You know, there, there's, there's, there's something that uh, archers, this is what they ought to be shooting. So Nancy and I started going back to the tournaments, to the shoots around the state. And to some of the shows, Anderson's Archery Clinic had a big, uh, big event every year that drew all a bunch of dealers and people. And we just started putting out a table of longbows and literature. Uh, I, I bought a hundred magazines from from uh, Howard Harvey, the, the Longbow Shooters Digest, <clears throat> and I would sell them at the tables. I made up a <coughs> excuse me. I made up a, a video. I think I was one of the first ones to use a. A TV monitor at a show, and I did this at Anderson's. I got, I rented some Howard Hill shorts, put them up on a screen, and I had one of the first video cameras around that they, they used to set up on your shoulder, and you had a power pack hung down here. And I videotaped the Howard Hill shorts on this screen, put them together in a little package, with, and narrated a little bit. Took it to the shows, and I, it was some Timbo and some of Howard shooting stuff out of the air. And I would show this at the shows. People would stop and they would look at that stuff and it just fascinated them. One of the people that got hooked by that was Jerry Brown, Great Northern Longbows. Jerry come by my booth and he stood there and he watched Howard shoot. Never said a word, looked at the bows, walked away. Ten minutes later he's back, looking again. A few minutes he walked away. Twenty minutes later he's back again. And I said, uh, would you like to shoot one of these? He said, uh, he said, yeah, he says, I'm left-handed. I said, well, I got a left-handed one here. So we walked over to the practice target there, and uh, Jerry took a shot, and he'll, he'll tell you this story if you ever talked to him about it. His first shot was right in the bullseye. His eyes got big, and he looked at me, and he said, whoa, that was fun. And I had a deal with Anderson's, I couldn't sell those there, and I'd already started my, my archer shop, uh, my business in, in 1980, and I was uh, buying bows from uh, Tim Miggs and Howard Hill Archery, trying to get people involved in my area. So Jerry came over to, to my uh, shop, which was at the time in the house, and uh, ended up going home with a brand new longbow. Shortly after that, he, Jerry owned a hardware. Shortly after that, he sold his hardware, in, with Rick Shepard went into building bows full time. So for 30 years at least, I've been promoting traditional archery and longbows. In uh, 1981, I met a fellow named Fred Trost who was starting a, uh, an outdoor program in, uh, called Michigan Outdoors. And, uh, he, he came up to my table and he told me about his show and what he was going to be doing. And um, <clears throat> he said, I hear that you shoot stuff out of the air with that ball. And I said, yeah, sometimes. And he said, can I get you to come out here in the field and we'll do a little demonstration. I can get it on, on, a, on a video camera. And I said, yeah, okay. So uh, <clears throat> I had a friend of mine go out there and I, we got some had some discs and stuff, and uh, he did a little interview on tape. He didn't want me to tell him about the longbows and stuff, and, and I threw up some big discs and shot them out of the air. And then I got to telling him about Howard Hill, how Howard Hill used to shoot coins out of the air. 
He said, coins with a long one or with an arrow? And I said, yeah. He said, have you ever done that? And I said, well, I've tried it once in a while. And uh, so he talked me into trying it on, on camera. And the second shot, I hit a quarter. Or it was a quarter, half dollar, I can't remember. Hit a coin on the air. You could hear it when it clanged. And anyway, that impressed Fred. And he had me on his show several times. And he's the guy that was actually the instigator of getting the Longbow organization going in Michigan. He kept saying, Ron, he said, you've got to get an organization started. You've got to get, you know, you've got these people that are interested now. You've got to get them together and, and get something going. So in 1983, by that time, I'd, I'd gotten enough people together and, and uh, we started a, a, a Michigan Longbow Association with just a handful of members, probably less than what you guys got here. In uh, that organization, uh, is still going today. Here is their 25th anniversary issue of Stick Talk. And I'm very, very proud of the fact that an organization that I was involved in and got started is, is uh, still going. And this, this, remember, is not just traditional archery. This is longbows, wood arrows. And, uh, we got the, the Great Lakes Longbow Invitational going in 1985, and that's been going every year since. So, uh, in some of the people that I've met in, in my uh, time, in, in tra traditional archers are some of the most wonderful people in the world. Uh, but I've met some really, really fine folks. I'll, I'll never forget meeting Jay Massey. I'd read Jay's books. And uh, really admired his writings and, and everything that he'd, he'd done with the tra in traditional archery, hunting moose in Alaska. And uh, it was our second Great Lakes Longbow Invitational. We invited uh, Dickie Roberts and Jay Massey to come to uh, the Great Lakes Longbow shoot. And they showed up, and uh, I saw Jay standing over there, and I walked over toward him. And um, he turned around and I said, Jay, I'm Ron LeClaire. And stuck my hand out and he said, Ron LeClaire, he says, I've heard so much about you. <laughs> and then it was just, <coughs> Jay was such a, a genuine person. He was the kind of a guy that never blew his own horn. He, uh, he had just had an interest in people. And uh, I admired him more than anyone I think I've ever, ever known in archery. Later on, uh, Jay and I were doing a, a show at Anderson's together, and uh, the Michigan Longbow Association had a booth, and uh, uh, Jay had uh, some literature there. He was talk, telling about his, uh, he was booking hunts for Alaska, and he was selling books, and it was real crowded on a Saturday, and uh, they had us on, on asphalt. Jay had been on his feet for hours talking to people. It was just a, a, people just kept coming and coming and talking and talking. Finally, later on in the afternoon, uh, we had a lull and there was nobody there. So I sat down, we had a couple chairs behind us. I sat down, I said, Jay, I said, come on, take a load off. So he sits down and he hadn't sat down 10 seconds. And uh, I said something like, feel good to take a load off your feet. Oh yeah, and he said, and then two, two young kids, well, a boy and a girl walked up, and they were probably about 11, 12 years old. And they started looking at Jay's pictures. He jumped right up, got up there and started talking to him, asking him all kinds of questions. Do you, you shoot a ball, and what's your name, and this and that. He just kept pumping for information. And then they would ask a question about this or that, and he'd talk. He sat there talking to him for several minutes. And, uh, they were getting ready to go, and he said, just a minute. And he reached over, and he took two copies of a thousand campfires, signed them to them, their name, Jay Massey, and handed them those books. And I've often wondered, I'd like, to, I'd like to know those kids or where they are now and what they've done, what that meant to them at that time. But it, it showed me a part of Jay Massey that uh, that I really, like I say, I really admired. He was such a such a genuine person. I got to meet Glenn St. Charles uh, 
at, at one of the PBS banquets, and uh, he talked to me, uh, took me aside, and asked me uh, my opinion about a traditional uh, record-keeping organization. That's eventually what uh, Glenn is the one that, that got the ball rolling on on that, and that's how Compton came about. And uh, well, I've skipped the part about True Haven. Am I running over time here? Are you guys getting bored? Yeah. I'll, I'll tell you just a little bit about True Haven because <coughs> Jim wanted me to talk about that. Got a, got a little piece of property in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan that uh, is just so dear to my heart and I, I just love it up there. To, I say we, myself and two other hardwood floors, tamarack logs, vertical logs. Bought the cabin for $3,000, which I thought was a steal because I couldn't build it for that, and had it moved by some movers into the location where I wanted it, right on the bank of the Armstrong Creek. And uh, we, the first thing we did is put a new tin roof on it and fixed it all up. And, and uh, we go up there every year I say we, myself, and there's six of us, six or seven that go up there every year in, in, in Bohan. And on my website, there's this little piece that I wrote about True Haven. Nestled in a secluded valley, far off the beaten path, on the banks of a small stream was a little cabin called True Haven. Originally built in 1936, this rustic pine cabin was only recently moved to its current location. The original intent was just to have a hunting camp, a place to hang your hat and your bow. But True Haven has become more than that, much more. True Haven has revealed itself in an enchanting environment where the bow hunting experience has enhanced tenfold. It is a place of peace and tranquility, a place where a person can recharge their spirit, feed their soul, and share wonderful times with fellow bow hunters. The Ghost of Armstrong Creek. Armstrong Creek is a special place where whitetails get real old. No one ever goes there for it's haunted, so we're told. Years ago, a man named Armstrong came to pan for gold. Hostile Indians took his scalp and left him naked in the cold. They say his ghost is still around, that he's looking for his hair. Now, most folks believe the story and no one ever hunts there. Well, I don't believe in ghosts and such. My blood's not made of milk. I just know there's bucks in there with horns as big as elk. Come this weekend, I'll be there, just me with my stick and string. No ghost is going to scare me off. I'm going to do my thing. Saturday morning in pre-dawn light, I crept along the creek. The smells were old. I heard a noise. I felt my knees go weak. A monster buck suddenly appeared through the trees upon a rise. I drew my bow. The cedar shaft flew just like it had eyes. The buck was down. His rack was huge. I need help to get him out. I turned to leave, but something made me stop and turn about. And there he stood beside my buck. He was ghostly, pale and thin. His scalp was gone. His naked body wore nothing but a grin. I was frozen in my tracks. I couldn't move or speak. I was standing face to face with the ghost of Armstrong Creek. He spoke to me. The sound was strange like nothing I'd heard before. Good shot, old coon, he said to me. I thought he might say more, but he turned and vanished in the shadows. My legs suddenly found life. I flipped that buck upon his back and pulled my hunting knife. A slash, a pull, his guts were out. I grabbed him by a horn. Two hundred pounds of whitetail pulled as easy as if newborn. Now there's more big bucks back in there, boys, but they're not for the meek. If you think you're brave, my friend, Try hunting Armstrong Creek. Mm -hmm.